party people! Welcome once again to the Party of One podcast, the actual play RPG podcast where the gaming table is always set for two. I'm your host as always, Jeff Stormer. This week, in honor of the spookiest day of all, Halloween, I am joined by a friend of the show, Blaine Martin, host of You Are Not Alone, for a game of A Knife. A Knife by Natalie the Knife is a short one-page horror game for two people, designed to depict a murder scene in a slasher film. To put it simply, one player takes the role of a slasher, the other player takes the role of that slasher's victim. You go back and forth depicting the struggle and the eventual, you know, casualties that go into this murder. It is a cool game. It was an evocative, rich horror game that is incredibly played with the real knife. And I'm I'm very, very, I, I saw that and I immediately knew I had to play it on the show. I knew I had to play it on the show with somebody local because we needed a real knife on the table. And I couldn't be happier. It was a delight. Please go check out uh, A Knife on Itch.io. You can find that in the show notes. Also find the show notes a picture of all of the knives that we talk about in this episode because we talk about a bunch of knives. You can find a picture of those knives also in the show notes. You Are Not Alone, like I said, is a two-player actual play horror podcast. Uh, In it, every episode, Blaine sits down with a guest talks through their fears, the things that they want to explore in a horror context, and then plays through a short two-player horror game, allowing them to sort of explore these terrors and fears and horrors in a safe and in safe and enjoyable actual play environment. I was on the second episode. We played a game of Lovecraft-esque that involved the world of professional wrestling. It was very cool. It's one of my favorite actual play experiences that I've ever done. Uh, so you should go check that out. You can also find a link to both You Are Not Alone and that episode in specific in the show notes below. Lastly, before we dive in, a quick reminder that I'll be at Metatopia from November 7th to the 10th and at PAX Unplugged from December 6th to the 8th. If you're at either convention, you should track me down and say, hello, I would love to talk to you and maybe play a game, maybe just chat, hang out. I love those both of those conventions. I can't wait to go. I'm going to be doing panels and play tests and games at both. You'll be able to find the stuff that I do pretty easily if you follow me on Twitter at Party of One Pod. Or check the show notes as episodes come out and you, the information will be out there. And with all that said, let's go ahead and throw it over to me in the past so that he can get started with the show. Take it past me. Thanks, future me. This week, I am sitting down with my good friend, Blaine Martin. Blaine, thank you so much for coming on Party of One. Thank you for having me. I am so excited uh, just in general to be on Party of One, but also for this game in particular uh, and the Hall- Halloween spookums. It's going to be a good Halloween spookums. I'm so excited. Um, real quick, before we get started, though, why don't you take a moment and let the lovely listeners at home know about all the good stuff that you're working on that you might want them to know about? Certainly. Uh, so I am the host of You Are Not Alone. Um, you Are Not Alone is a 1v1 horror actual play podcast. Might sound familiar because I have stolen the concept wholesale from Party of One. Hey, you know what? I stole a lot of this from One Shot, so, like, I can't complain. Um, so I use role-playing games to create intensely personal one-on-one horror stories with people they give me, uh, guests give me a survey with things that scare them, things that they don't want to touch. And then I craft a story to kind of hone in on specific fears uh, that the guest wants to explore. So it creates a really cool kind of intense and personal experience. Yeah, uh, we played Lovecraft-esque for it like way back when, like one of the first episodes. Yes. And episode it's- Three? I think so. Chap- chapter two, episode three. It's chapter one was two parts. It's real good. Like I the episode love that, that we the episode we told the story we told was so freaking good and cool and creepy. Like I love it so much. Uh, and we can shamelessly plug the fact that oh, we yeah, wrote we a Lovecraft esque scenario based on that, which you can yep. get uh, on your itch.io. Yep. Also, I have uh, the game Born of Briar and Blood, which is available in Codex Hunger which just went up on drive through RPG, I think like a month and a half ago. So you can buy that and play my weird game about folk creatures who are slowly dying. I love that. That's a, that's a hell of a pitch. Um, I think that's about it. All right, cool. Oh man, you do good. Sh- you do good shit, Blaine. You do good so stuff. Do, so I like- do you. Thank you. So, uh, this week for this week for our, you know, we wanted to get in some real good horror. I figured with you are not alone being horror, it felt right to do like a good two player horror game. So we are playing a knife which is a two-player horror game that really requires two people to be in the same place at the same time on account of, and really, when, now that we're going to like start talking about it, we should really talk about this is a game that requires uh, two people in a space across a table from one another with a big scary knife in between them. 
It is so beautiful. <laughs> it's like a beautiful, beautiful thing. I remember I read it. Like, I literally went on to itch.io and just like flipped through like two player games and i read this one and went yeah okay that rules like i love like it literally just says like you will need a you will need a big scary knife that you can murder someone with and i was like yeah okay that owns okay yeah. we're, we're gonna do this That's for the show the, at some point the only thing you need to play the game really a one page sheet of rules and a large knife so uh which brings us to the jumble of knives that i have in front of us i'll post a picture in the show notes and on the website so people can see it but um Yes, it is a visual that needs to to People, truly be seen to savor. So, um, as we're so the premise of the game is it is a murderer and a victim. It is the maybe the first murder, maybe one of the murders in a slasher movie. You, uh, one of us is going to be playing a murderer. One of us is going to be the victim. The murderer is going to stalk the victim through their home and kill them. And they might resist. They might get away. They might die. We'll figure all that out. But. We kind of need to know a little bit about, like, who our murderer is and who our victim is to kind of get things going. And I figure since we need a knife to make this, like, to make the game work, I figure, like, the choice of knife should inform, like, and will give us some good direction on, like, who our killer is. So I've laid out, like, really most of the knives that I have in my house in front of you. And I'll kind of give them a brief sort of visual walkthrough so our listeners can, can get a picture of it. And then we'll choose one, and then we will immediately take a five-minute break so I can put these knives away, because my cat has been, like, stalking the apartment, and I'm terrified that she's going to jump up and there's going to be a problem. Yeah, it's uh, not a cat-safe environment cur- currently. Um, so so the, what we have, the, the most of the knives we have are from, like, a set that my wife got for her five-year anniversary at work. They're these very beautiful, very modern-looking uh, they are from Cutlery, New England. They are these beautiful, like, marble finished. They've got this beautiful black blade with white speckling. They've got kind of a lizard skin hilt. They're, like, excessively modern looking knives. And we have, like, um, sort of a long slender knife. We have sort of more of a fishing knife. Uh, we have a serrated bread knife, which I was like, well, that might be cool and weird. And then we have sort of a larger traditional butcher's knife all in that style. Uh, we also have here, like, just a really old, busted-ass steak knife from Ikea. I'm pretty uh, sure I have three or four of those floating around in, in my house as well. They're they're trusty knives. I mean, this one has lasted a decade. It's definitely on the duller side because it has seen a lot of use. It's It's been through a lot of steak dinners. Um, I also have here an X-Acto knife, which I think is pushing the definition of a knife, but it is technically a knife, so it works. It has a handle. Uh, and it has a sharp blade. Yeah. There is something in the rule about how you're not supposed to move the knife more than the length of the hilt. And I think in this, if we if we were to go with the X-Acto <laughs> knife, we might have to, like, shrink that. Yeah, because it uh, it's, it's more hilt than blade. And then, uh, speaking of hilts, we also have... You can hear them clanging around a little bit. I have this throwing knife and or punching dagger that is rainbow colored. Uh, Party of One and all my fancy children listeners have heard me talk about my rainbow sword before a lot. It came with these, like, th- I, I guess they're throwing knives or punching daggers. I'm not really sure which, because they're not really mm. large enough to hold in a traditional knife way. No, it's definitely not. Uh, but, like, there we have this weird fantasy master throwing knife that is rainbow colored. I and do love the, the rainbow colored nature of it. It makes it very tempting. It is very cool. And then we also have this very other... Like, this other classic kind of kitchen knife that's a little bit nicer. This one is cool, though, because it has a sheath. This is the only knife that we have that has, like, an actual proper sheath. And I feel like there's some storytelling potential there as well. So, Blaine, let me ask you, which of these knives is really jumping out at you the most? Like, which of these knives can you, like, do you want to tell a story about a murderer using? It is, it's a tough call because they are all wonderful. The two that I'm drawn to kind of immediately... Uh, is the serrated bread knife, because I feel like that is a weird murder weapon. It is a weird murder weapon. It does look like it could kill you, but it is definitely, like, a weird murder weapon. Because it is, like, it's not a stabbing knife, it's a cutting knife. Right. Uh, which I think adds some interesting potential. Yep. Um, and on the same thing, I think the old Ikea steak knife is also a good potential, because I like the okay. idea of, like, a dull yeah. blade uh, for the kind of horrifying potential. Yeah, there's some horrifying potential, especially in the fact that it's not like a cool knife. 
Like, it is very much just, and it's, it is, like you said, the kind of knife that you probably have three or four of in your apartment. You no longer have the matching set. It's probably like eight, and you're now down to three or four, but you have it in your home, I guarantee. And there are several that have been broken that you have thrown away over the years. So these, so of these two, which are we, which, what, what, what speaks to you? Of the two of them, I really, the more I talk through, like, the busted old Ikea knife, like, I mean, this, like, this feels cool in a very uncool way. This feels like every, like, the, the, even the bread knife, like, it being so modern and sleek feels kind of intentional. And I almost like the idea of, whether supernatural or not, the idea of a murderer that is using things that are not, the, like, is not, you know well off or well equipped or well armed or well prepared you know what i mean he grabbed the first knife he or she grabbed the first knife that they could find and that has become their signature and it and it could be you know this time it's a busted old like steak knife next time it could you know it it could just be they beat you to death with a trash can there's there's an or there's an energy to the to the ikea steak knife of like a very it's it's not you know the big cool machete it's sort of just you grab whatever thing, whatever thing is going to hurt, and you put them in the ground with that thing. Yes, this murderer is the MacGyver of slasher murderers, where it's just whatever's on hand I and love it gets it. used. I love it. All right, now I'm going to immediately put the rest of these guys. Yes, that's away. good. Uh, take a picture. Oh, I already have a picture. Oh, you already have a picture. Excellent. I also like the Ikea knife because it's the safest of the knives that we have. Yeah, I don't think... Uh, even if we tried, we could kill each other with that. Right. Knife. I think I think the relative risk is fairly low. So, OK, so we've now put the knife in the middle of the two of us. Um, it will move over the course of the game. It is facing uh, all sort of away from both of us, sort of horizontally <laughs> perpendicular. We're both facing perpendicular to the knife. I like that that is also stated in the rules. Yes. Yeah. Like, literal safety mechanic. Literal safety rule, <laughs> please, which please I appreciate. Please do not point, th- point the knife at either player. So, Blaine, the big question, do you want to murder or do you want to be murdered? That is a good question. I will leave the choice up to you. I would happily be the murderer, uh, but I would also happily be the victim. Oh, gosh. I I think I kind of want to be the victim on this one. All right. <clears throat> I can play a murderer. Okay. So, with all of that, like... The game is set, you know, the game is set in a fairly modern-ish environment. It is, I mean, you know, the specifics of time and place obviously will kind of leave. It's really all up to you because how we start the game is this is one long, uninterrupted take of a, of a horror movie, a slasher movie. You are going to set the scene. You're going to walk us through the apartment or walk us through whatever space the murder is happening in. You're going to, you know, give us some time and place details as we do that. Zoom the camera around. Take us around. Show us where the murderer is introduced and then show us where the victim is like entering the space, all of which is going to be one. And and as we play through the rest of the game, this is going to be one long, uninterrupted take Uh, the rules. I'll kind of give them all up front. Once the victim is introduced, which will be me, I'll go through like how I discover I am being stalked and like attacked. And then what will happen is every time you sort of get one up on me, corner me, savor the murder, you know, every time you act like a horror movie villain, we move the knife closer to you, and every time I, you know, put something in place, I defend myself, or I get away, I make an escape, every time I do something in my advantage, I'll pull the knife closer to me, whomever, like, whenever the knife reaches one of us fully, it reaches one end of the table, if it reaches me, uh, well, then we'll cover the ending, I'll reveal what happens then, or at any time, if we feel unsafe, uncomfortable with the situation, or simply think this should be the end of the story, we can pick up the knife, at which point we describe how the victim gets away with an inch of their life. Make sense? Makes sense. All right. Well, with all that, take us through the setting of our, of our slasher movie attack. So we start on a street. It's a regular kind of all-American suburban street. White picket fences dot some of the lawns. Some relatively nice cars are parked along the side of the street in parking lot or in um, driveways. And we find ourselves looking at maybe a mid 70s brick house. No picket fence for this one. 
but a nice wraparound porch. There's definitely a wooden swing on the front mm -hmm. <clears throat> front porch. A white door, windows with white drapes showing. And we move closer. Very slowly, very intentionally, the camera moves closer. And we go in through the bottom left window. And we find ourselves in a living room. There's a nice paisley couch. I guess as nice as a paisley couch sure. could be. Nice-ish. Nice, nice for, nice for, nice, nice for a paisley. A TV that shows that it's probably not 2019, but probably like maybe 2005. Okay. So a, a relatively bulky right. flat screen. And the room is dark. And all of a sudden, the television blares on with static and white noise. And the camera turns, and we hear a loud noise, and we're not sure what it is at first. And then we realize it's just popcorn on the stove being popped. Uh, I have just gotten home from work. Um, we see it is an older man, sort of like mid-40s, early 50s. Probably was a, I'm going to, I'm going to say probably was a like horror movie star from like that generation. Let's see. Let's just lean fully into it. It's Kurt Russell. It is, it is <laughs> absolutely played by Kurt Russell. Um, older, but like not as not currently, um, is as uncool as like Kurt Russell can be, which is not terribly uncool because Kurt Russell <laughs> is extremely cool. But like, but you imagine that like outside of his films, he's probably kind of uncool, right? Yeah, like it's so like a a a very so you know there are some we we see, um, we kind of pan over towards it and we see there's probably like um maybe like maybe there's a horror movie poster like framed on a wall, but like this is clearly um you know an older person like an older man. Sort of salt and pepper hair, still that kind of long, that kind of long shoulder length Kurt Russell hair, a little bit of a mullet, but in a way that works, in a way that is a little frustrating. It's somewhere between a mullet and like full on long hair. Yeah, and it, and it works and it shouldn't. And you know, I'm wearing um, I'm wearing like a a dress shirt that has been rolled up just over my forearms, like the sleeves are rolled up, uh, the tie is half undone. There is um, like a, a an uncool craft beer cracked next to the popcorn that is popping, and I'm just like mumbling to myself like this is gonna be good. This is gonna be good. I've been waiting all week, all week. It is Friday night, and it is time to partay. And today we are having a partay of one. I'm very excited. A little bit more <laughs> Matthew Mc a little bit more Matthew McConaughey energy in that than I intended, but like it works. Yeah, it's kind of he's clearly like gearing up to just like veg out tonight, right? Like pop a movie, you know, pop in a DVD. It's and been just, a long week. You yeah, need, you need that popcorn and movie time, right? And he's just like, this is this is this is my night. Nothing, nothing, nothing is gonna mess it up. Almost on cue, you. What is what is uh, what is this Kurt Russell proxy's name? Uh, Kurt Russell here's name. Kurt Russell is playing Barton Maxwell. Good name. Thank you. <laughs> um, Barton doesn't see this, but the camera does. There's a face in the window of the kitchen. This is going to be born of an, uh, my own personal fear. Do you know what a Nesso doll is? A Nesso doll? No, I do not. I just learned about them because uh, a friend of mine has a collection of them. So they're stuffed animals that are based on uh, anime characters. Okay. Oh, I do. I do know. But I they think... have these giant, just empty white eyes. Oh, that's hor That's a nightmare. It is so terrifying. And uh, I went to play D&D &D Friday night and uh, sitting on the couch was a meter long <laughs> no. Nesso doll. No, I hate this. <laughs> with these gigantic, soulless white eyes. Uh, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. So I think the mask is kind of like that, where it's obviously bought at like a Halloween adventure, mm -hmm. uh, meant to be an anime character, but the eyes are just these gigantic white mesh eyes that whoever's wearing it could see through them. But whoever's looking at it just sees these unsettling blank eyes that are mm -hmm. about 
15 times too big right. for my face. Um, and no pupil, nothing, just pure white. And it's just staring. Not necessarily at, at Barton. Um, just into the room. Oh, that's so good. Do I see it? Or do I just go you off? You do not. Okay, yeah. just... So I just go off, like, I start flipping through the DVR menu. I got my big, clunky 2005 remote control. And I'm just flipping through, and I'm like... Uh, but what do we got? We got Bloodsport Four, The Dark Kumite. <laughs> we got uh, we got Dread Time Stories. We got Dead Time Stories. I'm pu- uh, monster. I-, I gotta put on Monster Brawl, and I pop on Monster Brawl. What is Monster Brawl? Monster Brawl is an actual real life horror movie or horror comedy that is. Um, first off, I, I do want to preemptively say. Nobody judge me for the. This is a real thing that exists. I did not make it, though I do believe that I perhaps incepted it into being. Uh, it is a movie about monsters from around the world that converge on the same like haunted location at the all at the same time to battle for the Monster Brawl World Championship within a professional wrestling ring. I hate. <laughs> How much I want to see that movie. It's not good. I want to emphasize that it's, like, bad. It's like, I, I love those, like, terrible, like, all of the holiday-themed horror movies. Oh, they're one. The Jack Frosts and the Thanks Killings are so awful. They're perfectly bad. They're but perfectly bad. But I love bad. them so much. Monster Brawl is kind of a treasure. Oh, uh, well, that, I know what I'm watching tonight. You gotta, you gotta check it out. Uh, so you put on Monster Brawl. Was Barton in Monster Brawl? Uh, Barton was not in Monster Brawl. I think Barton is like, I'm picturing Barton as very much, I think that we probably get, oh, you know what we see? We actually pan over, we see flip, We see Barton flipping through, and we pan over, and there's like a folder of headshots of like, um, very, of like, you know, headshots of like young sexy people, and like a picture of like somebody in an unconvincing muscle suit with like a fire axe to can you know, and and like and and we pan over, and he's just like, oh, finally, I can just I can just relax and enjoy enjoy the craft for what it is. And so he's flipping through. He was not in Monster Brawl though. I think he's just. <laughs> Did he want to be in Monster? I think he wanted to make Monster Brawl. I think he's a producer, and I think he wanted specifically to be the one to, like, I think he's... Who wouldn't want to be the one right. to make Monster He's just Brawl. like, I think I could have made this something special. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, right? So we see a shot that is kind of just a stationary camera looking over the back of the couch. Mm-hmm. And we don't really see Monster Brawl on the television, but the light of the TV yeah, it's like hitting- blares out. And so we see the silhouette of Barton's head, yep. that perfectly quaffed near mullet, yep. uh, glowing radiantly in the light of the television. And then all of a sudden, the static is back. The channel just cuts out in the middle. What monsters fight in Monster Brawl? Um, so I know. Let me. I'm actually going to look it up because I believe. I believe it is in fact laid out. I believe it is. I believe that we have the, like. I believe the Wikipedia for Monster Brawl, in fact, has lists, all of the all of the matches, like the matches that happen. <sighs> I know, so good, because I know there's a Frankenstein. I know there's a character named the Witch Bitch. Like it's. I love that they have like pro wrestling names like oh, Witch it's, Bitch. Oh, it's very. I mean, it is clearly made by people that know professional wrestling. Let's see. Let's see if it, we have actually um, Cyclops. So we have um, round. We'll go with we'll go with here. We'll go with the mummy versus lady vampire. Excellent. Uh, so the mummy, I imagine. I don't know if this is the case or not. Pro- probably, I have. I have. I don't. I won't remember. So in go my on. mind, uh, the mummy has a, a move where like. He unwraps some of his bandage and like uses it to like hold the other person. If, if it if that doesn't that that sounds a not like a thing that happened in the movie that like it. I mean, if it doesn't, did, they they miss they missed a an opportunity. golden opportunity. So that's what he's got the like he's got the lady vampire in a headlock using yep. his linen wrap. Yep. Um, and then all of a sudden it just cuts to static. Yeah. Like the cable went out. Now come up. Come, uh. 
I, I, I swear, I do not pay. I do not pay the amount that I pay for the best cable package to have. This is every time I'm I'm moving out of this neighborhood. I am moving. I am I am getting it. I am selling this godforsaken apartment, and I'm just mumbling this as I get up and I start like slapping the TV, expecting that that's gonna do anything. You start slapping random things because I mean that's what all all guys do when yeah. something stops working. Uh, they just start hitting it until it submits. So we see Barton slapping the cable box, slapping the television. Um, and then we see a figure. I imagine that there's a sliding glass door yep. in this room. Because, I mean, it's a, it's a slasher film. There yeah. has to be yeah, a sliding yeah, glass of course. door. And there is a sudden peal of thunder and a, a flash of lightning. And standing at the sliding glass door is not a tall figure, maybe five, six, five, okay. seven, um, wearing kind of uh, baggy black clothing, like a baggy black hoodie, mm-hmm. um, baggy black sweatpants. So it's very hard. You can't yeah. tell a gender. It is of a height. And a clothing style that it could be either a man or a woman. But Barton sees that mask. And it's just got this gigantic anime smile. And these awful, giant, soulless anime eyes. Mm -hmm. And it is standing there. Again, not really looking necessarily at you. Right. Just staring into the room. And I think I finally, I think this is when I finally, like, see you, right? Like, I grab the phone, I grab my cell phone, my flip phone, and I'm talking into it, and I'm just like, yeah, and I'm, like, hitting buttons, and I'm like, oh, my God, oh, my God, with the menu. And I, like, pause for a second, and you just see, like, this disbelief and horror on my face. Like, the camera has panned over from you and panned back as you just hear me in the background being like, another freaking menu, and then I... And then it pans over and it kind of zooms in on my face and it sits there for a second. And then, <laughs> okay, all right, that's pretty good. That's pretty, if you just, all right, if you just want to hand me the script or give me whatever you're, whatever pitch you're giving, you're making, give me the treatment and I'll look it over because this, this is, this is working for me. I'll, I'll tell you this is, this is working. You got something here and I appreciate the guts. The figure raises a hand. And opens and kind of flexes its fingers back. Mm -hmm. And it's not wearing gloves or anything. This is the only exposed skin you see. And it's dark enough that you can't quite see this at first. But then it puts its hand against the sliding glass window and drags it down. And there's this kind of awful wet squeaking. (sighs) And you realize that there's blood on the hand that is now streaked down your sliding glass window. And I, I... You know, I slowly start, I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh, fuck's sake. And I like slowly go down and I start to like push, like I push the the button down on my phone and I start backing away and I start trying to dial and, you know, uh, I'm going to move the, I'm going to start moving this knife and I'm going to move it a little closer towards me as I start like dialing 911 on the phone and like backing away and. Nonetheless, still, like, not dropping the foot, like, still not, like, fully giving in to fear, but being like, okay, no, it's, all all right, I I swear I am moving out of this fucking apartment. Another peal of thunder, Mm -hmm. um, and a bright bolt of lightning that kind of illuminates the whole room for a second. And you look down at your phone to see what you're dialing, and you look back up, and I'm not there anymore, but the streak of blood is still there. And I, I stop dead in my tracks. Like I, I, I have nine one one written, and I just can't seem to push that green button. And I'm looking around, and I'm like, I'm just looking, and like I am completely. I'm gonna move this a little closer to you, back, and say like I am completely frozen. I am completely like because you are nowhere to be seen, and I'm wondering if I'm imagining this, and if that's just like a bug splattered, and like could have been. It's been a stressful week. And it could have been. And I am, like, I'm just, like, I've been working too hard. 
maybe I'm not in the mood for a horror. Movie. Maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see about maybe just reading like reading a, a nice book for a while. And I'm like, I'm closing the, I close the phone and I put it in my pocket and I start like, I go towards the door to like check the locks on it and I like start to move back towards the the glass door to check those locks as well. As you approach the front door. Um, to check the lock. It is securely locked. You kind of mm-hmm. jiggle the knob a couple times. I imagine there's probably a deadbolt, yeah. and you kind of shake the deadbolt. There's like two it. or three deadbolts. <laughs> like, I do that one. I do the little chain one. And then suddenly, the door bursts inward. Duh. Kind of pushing you backwards. Mm-hmm. And standing in the empty door frame now is that figure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh God. Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. And like the phone, I think goes tumbling, right? Like, and I, I'm like scrambling towards it at this point. Like I'm crawling on all fours. It know. is, it's a slasher film. So mm-hmm. obviously the figure moves. I move towards you very yep. slowly. Yep. And I reach into the kind of pouch on the front of this hoodie. Mm-hmm. Um, I pull out a dull Ikea steak. Knife. Mm-hmm. Um, and not brandishing it necessarily terribly menacingly, just kind of like loosely grasped, pointed out to the side, walking towards you as you scramble towards your phone. Uh, I think I look at that. I look at the knife in your hand and like, you kind of see me like squint at it. And then I look over off to my kitchen and I see (laughs) that the, um, like the, the utensil drawer is like dangling open. And I'm just like, but how did, how? Uh, and I'm still just like backing away, but like I'm temporarily like trying to like piece all of this together. <clears throat> Befuddled by the appearance yeah. of, you don't know if it's one of yours. It, I mean, it could be one of one of yours. Could be just, uh, just a steak knife this mm-hmm. person brought from home. Yep. And they're moving towards you faster and faster. And I'm just like backing up against like this far wall, right? Like crawling I'm, i go from the carpet to the tile like from the living room to the kitchen and i'm like backing up close like further and further and finally like i just you know in that i, I i'm just like scrambling and finally like i just sort of gra- start i grab like a um i just grab i grab something just like an object maybe i'm like i'm, I'm up against the wall the counter is up here and i'm just like fum- fumbling fumbling and I grab like I grab like a con- a full container of dish soap, <laughs> where it's just literally the first object that I find. And I just we I, we get a shot where I look at it, and I just go like, and I just wing it like as hard as I can straight at your head, as I try to get up and try to run past you and the other like straight past you. So I think you you hit me dead in the face mm-hmm. with this container of dish soap, and it tilts the mask slightly. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't knock it off. Though. Right. So now the mask is just kind of staring off at a diagonal. <laughs> Move that knife towards you again. And just staring off into the distance. And you are kind of, you scramble away. And at first I don't pursue you. Um, yeah. So I just run like straight past you. And like the camera just holds on you as you see me like run past you, like into the background. And you start fleeing. And as it focuses in on me. It kind of pans, the camera pans down a little bit, and you see your face. And I just step on the floor. <laughs> and there's this awful kind of crunching sound mm-hmm. as your phone just shatters. Yep. And move that knife a little closer. Um, and then I stand there for a moment, and that head is still just staring off. Yeah. Uh, at a diagonal. And then I start to. And I think, like, I think that we see, like, the camera has shifted, so you're kind of, like, maybe not even all the way on. Oh, yeah, I bet you're probably not even fully on frame, because, like, the mask is, like, not, like, the face of the mask, like, you only see, like, the edges of the mask on frame, and then we just watch it turn, so, like, the mask slowly just overtakes the camera, and then you're just running. And the camera is, like, slight, like, over your shoulder, you see me kind of blurry in the background running, and I'm just knocking over anything I can to, like, barely impede your progress like a table you know 
throwing papers at you and I'm like, I don't know who you are and I don't know what you want, but like, I promise I don't have it. If it's money, if it's power, I don't have it. I don't know what you want. Just please, please, you don't have to do this. I think I stopped for a moment and finally fixed my mask and Mm. turn it forward again. And I kind of cock my head to the side and look at you as you're running and saying all of these. And then I begin pursuing. again. Mm hmm. Move that knife a little closer to you. That was that was a real savor of the terror moment. Uh, yeah. So I think I, I think like I'm starting to run up to the second floor of the house, right? And I'm like I, I'm running, and I I kind of I stop just I stop and I take off one of my sh- I take off like a shoe and I just like throw again. I'm like I'm just winging things at your head, right? I'm just throwing things. I'm trying to climb up the stairs. I'm taking off. I finally like take off the rest of the tie that has been like dangling half off. And I, I like I, I take I I'm, I take off the tie and I'm like I'm running. I'm unbuttoning the shirt as I try to scramble with one shoe up the stairs. And I'm like, just keep looking back. Where are you? So I think that when I reach the stairs, something a little bit odd happens. I mean, not that all of this isn't a little bit odd. But instead of walking up the stairs like a normal person, I get down on all fours and begin to climb the stairs like an animal. Mm-hmm. That mask just staring up. Mm-hmm. And I think I, I see this and like the camera briefly zooms in on my face and I'm just, oh, for fuck's sake, or oh, for, for hell's, ah, oh, for damn it, oh, God, ah. Oh. And I'm like continuing to scramble and like I'm just I'm, I'm again I'm back on my I'm back on my butt like scrambling backwards. I finally like I kick I finally pull open a door and I just kick it with my my socked foot and I slam it shut and I try to get to my like I still have a landline phone. It's 2005. So I'm trying I'm trying to get to it. You were of an age that you would have a landline yeah. phone. Yeah. That makes sense. You get to the landline. And you hear, and you know that this person is strong. Mm -hmm. They booted in your front door. I'm not booting in the bedroom door. Instead, you just hear a scratching at the door. Fingernails Mm -hmm. down the door. And I'm just, like, staring dead quiet as I punch in 911. And I just hold the, the phone to my ear. And I like I just wait and I hear the first ring and I hear that second ring and I just wait for them to pick up. I mean, I think they pick up. I think I, I haven't cut the phone line. I start like whispering like I I I can't I'm in danger and I need help, please. My address is 1418 Summer Hill Drive. I, I need there's someone in my house. As you're talking to 911 from outside the door, in almost a kind of sing songy mocking tone, mm-hmm. I begin to repeat the words that you're saying to the 911. I hate that so much. It's the thing. I hate so much. I'm in danger. I hate it. Someone's so in my house. Much. I hate it. So much. And I'm just, um, I'm like, and I think I'm fine. I like whisper that and I just start like, I, I, I just, I lose it. I think at that moment, right? Like I, I think we, I think the camera kind of pans, like the camera, like slowly, slowly pans back to the door and you just see me like body it, right? Like you see me tumble. We both go through, you know, the camera just watches as I just doom, 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 slam. Door goes down on top of you, and the two of us just start like tumbling and tussling, as I've just lost any sense of like cool that I had here. It makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think you the initial surprise you definitely get the upper hand, mm-hmm. kind of at first. At this point, the like knock from the door spins mm-hmm. the mask around fully. Yeah. So now it is staring backwards, um, which is probably a little bit of a blessing. Like those yeah. eyes aren't looking at you yeah. anymore. Um, and as you're tussling and you begin to get a, a bit of an advantage at first, there's almost a, a moment where you remember just how strong this person is. Mm-hmm. 
and after the initial shock kind of fades, you're kind of, I imagine, wrestling, probably punching. Yep. And I just reach up as you're punching, kind of almost ignoring yeah. the blows and turn the head back around. So good. And then once those eyes are looking at you, mm-hmm. you feel my arms kind of just grab your shoulders and slam you upwards into the wall as I kind of just stand up and put you against the wall. That's real good. That's real, real good. Yep. That mad knife is moving way far away from me. And I'm just, I, I, you know, that momentary, that moment of, of like aggression and heroism is out the window. And it's just, please, I, just, I, why, I don't know why, I don't know what you want. I don't have it. You, I, I'm nothing. I am the third string, third associate producer. I got, I got nothing. If you want, if the, if you want, if you want parts, if this is, if you didn't get cast, I don't, I don't know, but I don't have it. I don't have what you want. And the face just kind of cocks and says, I don't have it. I don't have what you want. And that's when I start crying. Open, open mouth weeping. Like, as I just start to, like, beg. And I'm just like, I just, I, I, and I, I, I'm just like, I'm, 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 I'm thoroughly, like, helpless in this situation. I think that as you beg and cry. I make this sound that sounds like someone who wants to, like, who has a vague idea of what crying is. Uh, and it's obvious that I'm trying to mimic you again, but mm-hmm. I, I don't know how to make that sound properly. And then I just kind of lift you from the wall and throw you towards the end of the hallway. And I think I, like, I, 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 I go down, like, a ton of bricks. And I finally, like, I climb up. And I am, you know, my mouth, I'm bleeding from the mouth now. And like blood is dribbling down my chin and like the shirt is torn. And I'm just finally like barely keeping it together, but still at least like trying just anything that I can try. And I just like throw up my hands. I'm like, all right, then if this is how it's going to be, if this is how it's going to end, well, then let's do it right now, right here, you and me, because those cops are going to be here in any minute probably and i just got to beat you until then and if i get if this is self defense then that's fine as i'm just in you know babbling any thoughts that i have as i like badly square up right like my hands are all high and i'm just like staggering trying to like maintain composure so i reach back into the little pouch and pull out my knife again and almost on cue as you're saying that and i'm pulling out this knife there are sirens in the distance. Mm-hmm. It's a, not a big town. It wouldn't no. take too long for the police. And I'm just like, I hear that. And like, I hear that. And it brings me exactly no comfort as I still like stagger forward. And I'm like, it ain't going to help if I'm dead. It ain't going to help if I'm dead. It ain't going to help if I'm dead. And I like just start throwing like wide haymakers and trying to like bring you down just long enough for those cops to get through that door. So I think that as you're throwing the haymakers, I'm kind of blocking them Mm -hmm. and you don't get the impression despite my strength that I'm a terribly good fighter. Okay. Um, so I'm kind of very like sloppily and kind of lazily blocking and occasionally Mm -hmm. like lashing out with the knife. Oh, and I think the first time you lash out, I'm going to move it a little closer to you because I think the first time you lash out, like, you get right across the chest and I'm like gagging and whack I'm like wheezing as I like go up and I pop you one right up <clears throat> the head. And it's, you can feel how dull mm-hmm. this knife is. Like it doesn't do a yeah. terribly large amount of damage. I think it's more probably the shock yep. that you feeling that blade yep. kind of move across your chest, but it barely draws blood. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, I'm as I'm blocking, I'm kind of taking slow steps back and you have me a little bit. I'm going to move this a little closer to you. All right. Um, I think you have me on the ropes to some extent, mm-hmm. not necessarily that you're winning, but you are keeping me at bay. Right. And I think I, I think like the fact that I've got you on the ropes, like I, I start like, you know, I've at this point, like I'm bleeding from the chest and I'm like, 
you know, my knuckles are getting bloody from throwing punches. And I'm just like, all right. Yeah, OK. Where the hell are those cops? <laughs> they say, it's not that big a town. They got to be here eventually. As I just keep like, you know, body bow, bloody bow and like trying to like catch you as much as I can. You know, you know, I'm starting to gain a little bit more of my composure as I'm starting to throw these punches, trying to just like keep you in <clears> some <throat> manner of like on the defensive until they theoretically arrive. And every time you make contact with the mask, it shifts the mask yep. a little bit um, so that the uh, those eyes are staring off in different directions and almost like a montage scene of uh, different alignments of the mask as you punch. And I continue to step back and I continue to step back to where are the steps. And that's when you realize that this may have all been a and as you take kind of a long, overextended punch, I pivot mm -hmm. so that you are falling down the stairs. Oh, Rimini. Yep, that knife goes way over towards you. That's yep. Yeah, I just I go right down the stairs, and like I got a black eye, and you know I like I try to move an arm to like throw a punch, and it just you know, whack, like, you know, sags and wiggles, like, helplessly, and I'm like, oh, God. Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> oh, God. I'm just very slowly walking down the stairs. This time I'm walking, not on all fours. And I think, like, as you're walking down, I think, like, I'm just kind of, like, <laughs> it's a hell of a pitch. The one to make it. And I sit and I just kind of like, I look up at you and I think like I hear cars outside, right? And I hear like doors closing, but like you're just, you're, you're, you know, you're I move this closer to you and I'm like, you're like right there. Like, and I'm just like, okay. Can you at least tell me who you are? I am at the bottom of the steps. Mm -hmm. now. And I'm standing over you. And when you ask who I am, you see me reach up to the mask. And it looks almost like I'm going to lift it up. Mm -hmm. Like it's a mask. Yep. And as I do, you realize that it's not a mask. That's just my face. And I, I pick you up. And I turn you towards the door. Mm -hmm. Because I want you... To see the police come in and know how close, how close you were to being saved. Yep. And how futile it is. Yep. With that, the knife comes to you. So who's next? Who is the next person in Martin Maxwell's life who is targeted by, what was the name of the doll? Uh, Ness, the, the Nesso doll. The Nesso doll? The, li the living Nesso doll. Who is targeted by the Nesso doll next? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I don't, we didn't really establish anyone. Hmm. We didn't. I think, so maybe, maybe my true motivation is that I just really hate all of those terrible 80s films. Oh, I love, I. So I think I'm, I'm working my way through the cast. What I, movie were you, what is your famous slasher film? I think my famous slasher film is, mm -hmm. um. My favorite, sla my famous slasher film is Ashes, Ashes, We All Go Down. And it's just, it's like, it's, it's, it's similar, like, there's a similar element where, like, it was a children's, you know, the children's, the children's chant or the children's poem that, like, yeah. is used menacingly. And that was, like, the killer shtick. And so I think, like, I think what it is, is that a lot of the, a lot of the things that you were doing, like the imitations and things, like a lot of child's play, like Im like taunts and things, were sort of done a as a as a killer tactic. That like, and so I think maybe maybe yeah, maybe it is like the rest of the cast and crew are like the people that are that were being targeted. Yeah, I think that's a, the the end goal is the director, mm -hmm. but first all of the major cast members have yeah. to go. Yeah, like you got the producer first, like, and now now you're yeah. Then we probably you probably go for the cast and then the director. That's real good. And that's it. That's a knife. That was, that game is so good. It was really really good. Is the thing. <clears throat> I am overjoyed at how good that game is. Is the thing. Yeah, it's just so. 
elegantly simple. Yeah. And having a knife on it on the table in between you, even if you are friends, right, is a slightly it, terrifying it was, thing. It was ominous just like seeing a knife and like it just it like even though this is in fact a dull like a very dull like this is I mean this knife is really as dull as it's going to get. But like even so, like just seeing it being like that's dangerous. Like that could hurt that could hurt us. Yeah. It's very good. It is a good element. And, it, like, it's how, like, the idea of it just moving closer and, like, it's just, it ruled so hard. Yeah, seeing seeing the movement of it gives you this uh, amazing table feel of there is a very physical tension. I love it. And that's what I, like, I all of the best horror games, I think, do that. They have some kind of artifact yeah. that creates tension. Dread has the tower. Ten yep. Candles has the candles. Um, and having that kind of physical artifact. Yeah. of fear on the table does so much to help create mm-hmm. uh, a proper environment for it, telling horror stories. It just owns so hard. Blaine, thank you so much for coming on Party of One. This was amazing. This was a thank good... Thank you so much for having me. This uh, is a good episode. I got to channel my... Uh, I, I legitimately have not stopped thinking about the Nesso dolls. <laughs> the, so my friend has a whole collection of them. It's, uh, her brother has a whole collection of them. Um, and so there's the giant one that right. I, is the first one I saw, but like we went down into the basement and there was just a smaller one sitting on the couch, like on the back of the right. couch. And I didn't see it at first. So we're hanging out there <laughs> talking and I look over and I see it and I, I physically jumped. Uh, and then she took us into another room in the basement where there was more of them. Oh, good. Um, in different places so that the only way I could look to not see them was towards this one wall, and there was a mirror on that wall. So I had to very physically, like, fill up the mirror with my body, or else I would have seen them looking at me through the mirror. And it, it legitimately scarred me. That sounds worse than just seeing them. It's the thing, and seeing them through a mirror, it sounds worse That's why than I had to be like, because I'm like, all right, this direction is the only direction they aren't, but of course there's a mirror there. So I'm like standing in the mirror <laughs> trying to like puff my chest up so that there's nothing in the background. Incredible. Incredible. Um, so I got to channel that awful, awful fear that I felt on Friday night. Well, good. I'm glad that I'm glad I'm glad because it worked out very nicely. Real quick before we wrap up, where can people find you and your work online? Uh, so I have a Twitter that is uh, at not alone underscore horror. That is where I do most of my stuff. You can go to you are not alone pod dot com to listen to the podcast. Chapter two is our Lovecraft esque game. Mm hmm. Um, I have a Patreon that's at Blaine C. Martin, uh, where I occasionally re- release little horror, horror bits and bobs. And I think that's pretty much uh, wow. most of my, my social media presence. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a delight. And now I'm going to throw it over to me in the future so that he can wrap up with the show. Take it, future me. Thanks, past me. And thanks again to Blaine for coming on to the show. That game was creepy and scary and weird in all the best possible ways. It was a treat. Be sure to check the show notes for a link to You Are Not Alone, and be sure to follow Blaine on Twitter at notalone underscore horror. You should also check the show notes for a link to A Knife, because it's a cool, weird, creepy horror game, and it's a fucking blast. And I loved playing it, and I think that you will love playing it too. While you're on Twitter, follow us at Party of One Pod, then like the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Party of One Podcast. Uh, you can hang out on our Discord at bit.ly slash Party of One Discord. Talk to us about the show, gritty, eggnog, wrestling, all of the things people want to talk about these days. Uh, if you enjoy the show, consider leaving us a nice review on iTunes, Podcatcher, Podchaser, Podbean, whatever podcast platform you listen to probably has a review function, and it would mean a lot if you gave us a good rating. You can also give us some love on social media to recommend the show to a friend, anything to help us grow, find new listeners, and do bigger, better, and cooler things. You can also support the show financially at patreon.com slash jeffstormer. That supports not just the podcast, but also the games I design, community support stuff I do, and all that cool kind of stuff. Uh, you can also go to coffee.com, that's K-O-F-I dot com slash jeffstormer, and give me a, buy me a coffee, or I guess more accurately, a craft hot cocoa. Or you can go to uh, paypal.me slash jeffjstormer and give me your money that way. Any of those things directly fund podcasts, games, all that kind of stuff, and means the world to me. One last thing you can do to support me is to listen to the other podcasts that I produce, All My Fantasy Children, which is a character creation, storytelling, and world-building podcast powered by you. Every week, my best friend Eric Tano Saez and I sit down, we take a listener-submitted prompt, we spin it into an original fantasy character, and we populate a shared universe one story at a time. You can find new episodes every Friday at allmyfantasychildren.com. 
And yeah, that's really how you can support me in the show. Uh, Party of One is produced and edited, as always, by Jeff Stormer and Jen Frank. All music for the show comes from the song Infinite Lives by Megaran, featuring the D&D Sluggers. If you'd like to inquire about advertising rates, press coverage, or about coming on to the show as a guest, you can reach me at partyofonepodcast at gmail.com. And that's it. Until next time, thank you so much for listening. Remember to fight the forces of fascism every single day. Remember that self-love and self-care are radical and defiant acts of resistance. And as always, party on, everybody.